Hello, I'm Zonafir and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. We've now reached the point where you can buy Sandy Bridge processors for pennies. Not figuratively speaking, but literally pennies. The cream of the crop of processors in the early 2010s are now almost entirely worthless. But does that mean they are useless? Today, we're going to find out. I travelled to Doncaster to pick up one of these processors, the Intel Core i5-2400S, setting me back the whole of 10 pence. I also picked up the AMD A6-3670K on the same day from Computer Exchange, so I had the choice of delivery at £2.95 an item, or catch a rather lengthy bus from my town to Doncaster, so of course I opted to spend two and a half hours on a bus. I actually picked this up a while ago, but various things have delayed me getting around to this one. First of all, the only Socket 1155 board I had at the time I bought it was a fairly basic old Intel board that only supported 8GB of RAM and then I couldn't get the board to agree with anything newer than a GTX 750Ti. I did initially plan on testing it with their specifications, but I quickly realised something. The Core i5-2400S, a processor from 2011, could do better than what the GTX 750Ti could put it through. I tested a few games before I decided to treat the 2400S to a setup it deserved, and I'm including them in this video for project completeness and your enjoyment. I'll get more into that a little later though. The Core i5-2400S is a 4-core, four 4-thread four processor released in early 2011. Featuring a base speed of 2.5GHz, this more energy efficient chip can still boost up to 3.3GHz under ideal conditions, although this didn't really seem to happen too much in my testing. It features 6 megs of L3 cache, and is the kind of processor you'd see in office machines up and down the land, chugging away at Excel spreadsheets for years, day after day. With a 65W TDP, the Core i5-2400S uses a fair bit less power than the more high-end parts of the era, but this process was no slouch by any stretch of the imagination. Sandy Bridge was a revelation in computing, and this shares the same DNA as those higher-end parts. But what can a 10P processor do for you today? After initially testing this on the Intel board, I asked you guys which you would prefer, and the end result was get a better board. I did buy a better board within a week or so, but it sadly arrived damaged and entirely unusable, ultimately leading me to return it. It's a shame, because it was a decent board. I patiently waited for a better board to come along, and one finally did. An Asus P8Z68VLX. Socket 1155 boards are dirt cheap now, and I picked this up for 20 quid delivered. It's a nice board, and one I will no doubt be using again in future videos. USB 3, overclocking and crossfire X support, and generally just a well-featured board. I've paired the 2400S up with the Asus board, as well as added in 16 gigs of HyperX RAM clocked in at 1600 MHz. It's the same memory I used in my Pentium G3258 review, and everything tested today has been done from solid state drives on Windows 10. Moving on to the GPU, I've added in an RTX 2060 for testing today, slightly newer than you probably normally use, but I'm a fan, and it's a solid lower mid-end card, and the limiting factor here is going to be the Core i5 rather than the GPU. Here is the four specifications of the system I've used to test today, with a slight caveat to the GTX 750Ti stuff I'll be showing right at the start here but clearly differentiated. Let's get started. I'm breaking from tradition here, but for a change Fallout 4 isn't first. Red Dead Redemption ran really well on the 750Ti in my initial testing, and at 1080p default it was more than an enjoyable experience on the 2400S. It was thoroughly decent, even managing to hold around the 60fps mark in Armadillo, and this is on 8GB of RAM initially, if you'll excuse a slight labelling error here. Frostpunk is next, and it's about here that I started noticing the GPU bottleneck for the first time. At 900p and using the low preset, you can see here that the GeForce GTX 750Ti runs out of steam well before the Core i5-2400S does. It does well, don't get me wrong, a 50ish FPS frame rate is nothing to scoff at in Frostpunk, as it's more GPU intensive in my experience, but the 2400S still has more to give. Dying Light managed well on the GTX 750Ti, but again there was a slight GPU bottleneck in my testing at 1080p medium, even though we saw good usage across both CPU and GPU. Busy areas would hover around the 60fps mark, with larger, more open areas seeing above 80 FPS. It was enjoyable, but I still wasn't convinced the 750Ti was the right GPU for this job. Fallout 4 was the one that finally sold this to me. At 1080p medium, we can once again easily see that the GPU is a bottleneck here again, so this has made it 3 for 4 so far, and this was the point I decided to come back at the 2400S using better hardware on a better board. It was still playable on the 750Ti, but there was a significant deviation in frame rate depending on where you were, with a frame rate range from 34 all the way up to 60. This is as far as I got with the 750Ti here though. Enter the GeForce RTX 2060, and much more complementary hardware. First up, 
Second is Fallout 4. At 1080p, the new setup achieved much better results all around. At the high preset, Fallout 4 was a smooth experience on the 2400S, and I'd be more than happy to play like this any time of the day. I've done some benchmarking here, but I want to swing by my testing methodology later for older processors too, but we'll catch up to that in due course. Average for Fallout 4 was 59.9 FPS, with 5th percentile figures, 1% at 36.7, 0.1% at 18.8. Red Dead Redemption was actually a similar story to the 750 Ti in terms of performance, but this was done at much higher graphical fidelity. At 1080p high, the 2400S combined with the RTX 2060 managed a respectable average of 79.8 FPS overall, and with an OK 1% of 22.9 and 0.1% of 16 on the dot. We are near maxing out the 2400S here, and that does cause those percentile figures to be a little on the poor side, even though the games themselves are smoother than the numbers reflect. Dying Light swings back around, and once again this does so at higher graphical settings. At 1080p high, the 2400S put in another good performance, easily much better than what we were achieving on the 750 Ti a little earlier. Average was 97.7, with the percents being fine if nothing spectacular. 1% came in at 39.8 FPS, with 0.1 at 20.8 FPS. I actually played this for quite some time in my testing here, and it felt really good to play overall. The precinct is next. At 1080p and using the medium preset with FSR on, not a bad performer, but one that the 2400S definitely struggled a little on. While we mostly enjoyed the average of 52.1 FPS, city traversal in particular was a little problematic for the 2400S, and there would be a frequent stutter as you hit new areas. It's not a total deal breaker, but it does happen often enough that it's really going to depend on your personal preference if this is a bit too much. I found it fine, but it is frequently noticeable. While the 1% was okay at 21.7 FPS, the 0.1% was just 1, but again, more on this later. Counter Strike 2 had a very shaky start, but eventually found a groove on the 2400S. At 1080p and using competitive settings, the game started off with terrible stuttering, but it seemed to calm down as the round slowly progressed, and by the end of my testing it had reached a consistent point, even if the 53.9 FPS average isn't spectacular. Percentile figures were 1% at 5, and 0.1% at 0.6. Not great, but something that, by the end of my testing, wasn't reflective of how the game was playing. Once we were over the initial gremlins, CS2 was just about okay. Spider-Man was similar, a slightly shaky start before the 2400S seemed to settle in. At 1080p high with DLSS set to balanced, we saw an average of 36.1 FPS, with a 1% low coming in at 16.8 FPS. The 0.1% figure was appalling again, entirely down to the first few minutes of testing here rather than the last few. But this is what you will see as well, which makes it important to mention. I'm not here to cherry pick the best performance, but let you know how it is overall, stutters included. After that initial couple of minutes, was the game playable? Yes, it was, and ultimately that is a real measure by which 2400S should be judged. Consider a 30fps cap here to moderate the variation in frame rate though. Metro Last Light Redux performed great. At 1080p high, we saw great numbers all around the Echoes level, and overall it was a fantastic experience. Average was 188.5, with good percentile figures too, 1% at 115.2, and 0.1% at 39.3. Metro Last Light is a smooth, enjoyable time on the 2400S. Fallout New Vegas ran fine at 1080p Ultra, complete with all of the usual quirks of Bethesda's creaky game engine that isn't unique to the test hardware today. If you've played New Vegas, you know what I'm talking about. I don't run bench data on Vegas because the engine itself is so crap that it skews everything it touches, so I just eyeball the experience here, and you'll do absolutely fine on the 2400S. Hard Space Shipbreaker was pretty good. We fell a little short of 60 FPS here at 56.4 FPS, but the game was pretty consistent even with the percentile numbers so you should be interruption free in terms of performance as you pull apart those ships. The 1% low was 41.8, with a 0.1% coming in at an OK 21.1 FPS, so decent all around. I ran into some issues running GTA 5 Enhanced, something I need to look at a bit more, so I enjoyed GTA 4 on the Core i5 2400S. At 1080p and using the high settings, GTA 4 was a little inconsistent, but just about smooth enough to play, even with that inconsistency. GTA 4's PC performance reputation is well deserved though. Average overall was 58 exactly, but that was boosted by indoor areas which perform much better. In reality, expect around 30 to 40 FPS outdoors and driving. Percentile figures were so so, 1% was 22.3, and 0.1% at 9.6. Prey is next. At 1080p high, Prey saw an excellent average of 100.6 FPS, with a 1% low at 28 FPS. Once again, the 0.1% is where the figures turn very unflattering. 8.3 FPS was the 0.1%. I played the introduction in around 20 minutes after arriving in space, and I can confidently say that the 2400S performs a lot smoother than the 0.1% number here suggests. Dead Island now. At 1080p high, 
Dead Island was a solid experience on the 2400S. Once again, I played for around half an hour and it was a pretty good time overall, as you can see in the frame times on screen. Decent, with good performance numbers too. Average was 174.5, with percentile figures being 24.8 and a little on the low side, 11 for the 1 and 0.1% respectively. Frostpunk returns with its mystery 60 FPS cap, but it sticks to it like glue. At 1080p high, there wasn't a single problem to report here and the game looked great. It might have been mystery capped 60, but the percentile figures were also pretty good too. 38.4 FPS and 21.2 FPS for the 1 and 0.1%. This was pretty good overall. Our penultimate benchmarking game, Supermarket Simulator is up. 1080p, high, so some pretty good average and 1% numbers, with the average of 116.5 and the 1% at 62.5 FPS. The uncapped version of Supermarket Simulator is prone to the very odd stutter as we see occasional CPU usage spikes, but it's not a complete deal breaker. The 0.1% number is a troublemaker again, at just 4.3 FPS. And finally, Red Dead Redemption 2. It's been a pretty hectic couple of weeks and I did forget to start the benchmarking here, but I'd be only telling you what your eyes can already see. Red Dead 2 is sadly entirely unplayable on the Core i5 2400S, but just entirely held back by the Quad Core i5 and there's nothing you can do to alleviate it. GPU usage was very low because the 2400S ran out of power a long time before the RTX 2060 did and this results in a game that is just not playable. The big outdoors would see flashes of plus 30 FPS, but you couldn't really expect to play the game like this throughout. So. This one is a fail in my opinion. And that's the testing done for today, but this isn't a wrap. The thing about testing order processors such as the 2400S is that they are bound to deliver poor 0.1% lows, especially these kinds of energy efficient processors. Often I'll be playing along absolutely fine, and then when I look at the numbers, it feels like a disservice to the processor because it was better than what the data itself suggests. After my main testing, I went back and had another go at some of these games, but this time I forced capped the frame rate with the only measure being a playable, smooth as possible experience. I'm going to go through a few of these games again now. Once I capped Prey to 60 FPS, CPU usage was moderated and I saw an end to the variation in frame times. That 60 FPS cap didn't just flatten the frame times, it held back the CPU from rendering as many frames as possible and instead I just went for a smooth 60 fps experience. As you can see here, the 10p Core i5 2400S has absolutely no problems playing at that level. Similar can be said for Supermarket Simulator. Once I stopped maxing out the processor, it is fast enough to deliver a 1080p 60 experience that, for the vast majority of people, it'll be more than good enough. And again, Dead Island, a 1080p 60, Dead Island was an absolutely flawless experience, free of any problems with the processor trying to keep up. Capping the frame rate in Borderlands 2 leveled the frame times a lot more than uncapped. So what was initially a game all over the place suddenly moved from too inconsistent to pretty good with some very minor inconsistencies. And this brings me on to my testing methodology. If you're buying a 10p processor for gaming, I believe it would be unrealistic to expect it to clear 200 FPS stable in any game you threw at it. It's never going to do that, and it would be unreasonable to expect a 15 year old processor to perform in that way on anything other than games made much older than it. But can some of these processors hold up for some gaming today when you manage those expectations? Well, yes, some of them can. But then this brings up something else. Making videos like this isn't one size fits all. On one hand, there are plenty of people who just want to see the max that something can do, and that's more than fine. On the other hand, there will be a similar amount of people who just want to know if it can play games at a decent level, even if it means using frame rate limits to temper the frame time variations so that they get something that just works, even if it isn't setting any speed records. Unless it's something modern that should be expected to be ran at maximum performance. I often sit in the second camp, just making old stuff still useful, and shows that actually you don't need to throw these old processors away just yet. While obviously I set the rules for each of my videos, I've occasionally come into a little criticism over capping older stuff to make it playable and show that even old stuff is fine if you are realistic. And 1080p 60 high performance for a Core i5 2400S is certainly nothing to complain about if you're spending 10p. The thing is though, I don't mind differing opinions. Each video I make is iterative and I want to make stuff that you find enjoyable and informative. So I wanted to take this opportunity to ask all of you how you would like to see older processors and GPUs tested in future. Do you want me to simply get the maximum number of frames, even if that then leads to overall poor performance? Or do you want to see that, well, actually, you can still get use out of these if you play your games at realistic settings? This obviously won't apply to newer stuff, which I will simply test to get the maximum out of them, as you would expect to see for newer hardware. Let me know in the comments below which one you would prefer. I'm interested to hear what you have to say on the matter. 
As for the Core i5-2400S, it's still a surprisingly competent chip, and it's testament to how good the LJ1155 platform was as a whole. It's still fairly quick, and if you have no problems playing at 60fps, then a lot of games should be more than playable. If you want to run everything at max, the 2400S can still kind of deliver, but a combination of age and lower clock speeds will challenge a 2400S hard, and it won't always manage it, especially in newer CPU heavy games. Red Dead Redemption 2 in particular performed much poorer than I was expecting, and there's some kind of issue I need to look into regarding GTA 5 Enhanced, so I want to revisit that at some point too. For just 10p though, it's a great little chip that will play most of your games library with no real problems, providing you're realistic with what you can get out of a 10p processor. LGA 1155 kind of passed me by at the time, and the more I visit the socket, the more I feel that I missed out. On a different note, it's a pretty busy time of year for me, so while I will try to keep to my normal schedule, you'll have to bear with me while I beg, borrow and steal time to make more videos for you to enjoy. I've been Zonoff here, and thanks for watching. Until next time, bye bye.